Hi, uh, this is Jack Stanley, and I want to, as I have mentioned before, kind of spend some time talking about various wars and and historic events and look at the books and papers and documents and stuff that were all written at the time of the war. Because the interesting thing is that one of the most fascinating ways to understand history is to take a look at the time. Take a look what they were writing then. See what the arguments were. See how silly things were. See who agreed, who disagreed, why they were fighting, all these various things going on. And with the War of, the, of 1812, I mean, it was a long, simmering start to this. It goes all the way back to the Washington administration. Um, there were issues with England and, to a degree, France. And then um, things got worse. During the Adams administration, we got into a undeclared war with France, which was basically sea battles. Fortunately, we were able to solve them uh, through the efforts of John Adams to bring about a peaceful settlement. And we worked out a very, very um, good relationship with the French, which would in turn, with the next president, lead to the Louisiana Purchase, which was a massive section of land, part of the uh, what had been Spain, and then it went to France, and then, of course, we purchased, because Napoleon needed money for his conquests. And um, the thing is that during the Jefferson administration, we started having new problems with France, new problems with England. Uh, Jefferson declared an embargo, which very much destroyed the economy of the United States and led to an awful lot of angst between the Federalists and the Republicans. Now, of course, just so you understand what a Republican was back in the day, Republicans were more uh, farmer-issued, more uh, s small government um, larger state government, um, farmers and stuff like that. The Federalists were much more large government, um, industrial, business, etc. And um, the arguments back and forth caused some serious issues. And of course, Jefferson was a Republican. Adams was the last Federalist who was president. But that didn't stop the Federalist Party. And the Federalist Party was fighting tooth and nail against the Louisiana Purchase and many other of the actions of Thomas Jefferson. So much so that we should get to our first book here, if let me find it here, and talk about an individual. Uh, this book is just, uh, it's the quarterly Reviews is from 1811, and of course it was owned by a gentleman by the name of William Plummer. Now, William Plummer was from New Hampshire. He was very political. He was involved in Congress. He was involved in uh, being the governor of New Hampshire. Uh, he was a senator. He was everything. But he was also very much in argument with some of the ideas and some of the plans of the Republicans. And as far back as 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, he was pushing, he was pushing for a uh, secession <laughs> from the nation. Nothing happened from it, thank goodness. But here, this is one of his books, which he signed here, it says, William Plummer. Um, William Plummer was born in 1759 and died in 1850, full of years, and had changed. Uh, in, by 1812, he had changed and joined the Republicans 
the Democratic Republicans, which they are eventually known. And by the time we get to Andrew Jackson as president, they just dropped Republican altogether and became the Democrats. But William Plummer was very, very strong against the Louisiana Purchase and many of the actions of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was the arch enemy in many respects, as far as he was concerned for a while. Now, the war itself, move these books around here, gets off to a very slow start. Now, you have to understand, as I mentioned before, we had issues uh, with France, we had issues with England, and there was a magazine called the American Review of History and Politics. And uh, let me dig one out here for you. This is this is an 1811 issue here, but let's go here and just take a look at some of the stuff. And you will notice here's a front piece for the the magazine, which was the. And in this magazine, uh, you could purchase, you know, bound. And that's what I have here. I have a lot of these bound magazines. And a good deal of this was dedicated to state papers. They would put all of the government papers that had been issued in the back of each magazine. And it's a fascinating resource of what was going on in 1811, going into 1812. As we work our way through that, let me dig over here. Where's our American Review? There we go, okay. This is the American Review again. This is another issue. And this one's quite fascinating. And one of the interesting things so often is who owned these books? And this book belonged to Thomas uh, Hewson. And Thomas Hewson's got a fascinating story. His father was a surgeon and also studied dissection and things like that. He lived in London with his mother and his father, who was the doctor. And they had a tenant for many years. His name was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin lived there for many, many years and joined the doctor in the basement as they would work on various corpses, as it were, and studied them. It, it's kind of fascinating because recently there's been some discoveries in that house of bones and everything, and they're trying to figure out what was going on. But the good doctor died, and uh, Hussein and his mother were in serious straits. And so the whole family was moved to the United States after the American Revolution and lived for a while with Franklin, and eventually they got their own place to live, but young Thomas became a surrogate grandson to Benjamin Franklin. And he would spend much of his days in Franklin's library and also learning from the good old doctor, Dr. Franklin. And it's a treasure for me. Uh, this was Thomas's book from Benjamin Franklin's surrogate grandson, as it were. And this book is fascinating because it's the American Review, and the American Review only existed from 1811 to 1812, and it was gone. It seemed to have somewhat of an anti-Republican slant. Seemed to be more Federalist. And it's interesting when you look at this book here, and there's so much I'd like to share with you here with this stuff, but 
It's difficult to do. But let me just read something here. <sighs> this is what it says in the beginning of this picture. This is in January of 1812. As Americans, we are heartily ashamed of the message of the President of the United States and the response of the House of Representatives concerning the transaction. Now, what was this transaction? Uh, there was a fellow by the name of, uh, I believe his name was Mr. Henry, who said he had secret documents from New England showing how they were going to work with England and secede from the Union and collectively destroy uh, the rest of the nation, which was not very true. But Henry charged the United States government, which uh, Madison wholeheartedly said we should pay, for the documents, which were mainly fake. And of course, a lot of this started a lot of anti-English feelings. And as time went on with the impressed seamen and other issues dealing with um, borders and also the other aspects of this, which was the fact that they were stopping the shipping and interrupting shipping and causing an awful lot of issues so the United States eventually declared war on England. Now, I want you to think about this. We didn't really have too much of a Navy. We didn't really have too much of a military, but we declared war. There was one thing in our favor, one very fortunate person that is very, very instrumental in saving the United States from an awful lot of trouble. And that was Napoleon Bonaparte. This is an interesting book here. This is called, it's, it's the story of Napoleon and if you look here, written, and I don't know if it's readable, but in very old style of writing, it says the Russian campaign. Napoleon went wild all over Russia, all over Europe, and England and France were at war. There's lots of books. This is all from this period of time. This book's from 1815 called The Russian Campaign. Same with this book. This is from 1818. And the thing is that England was so busy fighting Napoleon, they could not put the great force of the English Empire against the United States. It's a very important point. The United States lucked out because in some of the battles that did take place, and of course we have the many battles where amazingly we, we, we survived. Of course, that was not true at all when it came to Canada. We decided to invade Canada. Henry Clay announced that the Kentucky militia could go and take Canada. We were soundly and thoroughly defeated in Canada. We left with our tail between our legs. We were totally destroyed by Canada when we were up there. It was embarrassing and stupid to even have tried such a thing. That cured that. Now, there was a whole bunch of stuff being written here. The English, of course, came over, and we started having many, many battles. Some were successful, many were not. We lost an awful lot of uh, the battles. Out in the Midwest, 
in Fort Dearborn, that was a mess. In Canada, that was a mess. In the Great Lakes, there were a lot of battles, but an awful lot of defeats. And it took several years, but eventually the war would end in 1814 in Ghent. Of course, it took a month for the information to reach the United States that the war was over. The British were in the United States fighting the, the Americans, and there was one final battle in January of 1815, which took place, you know, two weeks after peace had been declared in which the British were terribly, terribly defeated in the Battle of New Orleans by Andrew Jackson. But let's, let's just go through stuff here that's kind of fascinating. We went to Canada. This is something we don't usually talk about in our histories. We went into Canada and burned down their government building their House of Parliament. We went and destroyed certain areas. And, of course, the British were, were offended by such things. And so they came to Washington, D.C. and burned down our capital, the White House, and several other buildings. We don't tell the whole story with that's the reason why Washington, D.C. was burned down, is because we burned down things in Canada. Now, the War of 1812 was not popular. You know, that whole term, a popular war, <laughs> it, no war should be popular. War is a terrible thing. But we often... We often use that phrase, it was a popular war. Well, the War of 1812 was never a popular war. In fact, it barely was approved by Congress. Uh, James Madison declared war, and it squeaked by. That's how unpopular it was. I want to show you some stuff as we go along here, because... There's a lot of interesting things that happened. As I said, this book is filled. Thomas uh, Hooten's book here is filled uh, with a lot of amazing information. And by the way, this is Thomas Hooten's signature up here. It's just kind of cool to, to know that this belonged somebody who knew Franklin. In fact, you know, when Benjamin Franklin died, Thomas was given quite a few books from Benjamin Franklin's library. It's kind of interesting. Now, there's some fascinating books here I want to talk about. And here we have what is called the Analectic Magazine, which came out in 1813, and it was very much a Democratic-Republican uh, paper, and uh, here's the volume one of it, right here, yeah. volume one. The editor of this was Washington Irving, by the way, and this was much more supportive of the war than the the National Review of uh, Politics and History. And there's some fascinating things. In fact, they started talking about all the various people involved in the Navy, all the people commanding ships, and there was countless wonderful articles uh, in the Analectic that uh, showcased so many of these you know, military lead. And of course, one of the famous is, here's a good one right here for you, is Captain James Lawrence, which if you're familiar, 
Uh, Captain Lawrence and Great Lakes. He said, don't give up the ship. And of course, well, they eventually were defeated, but that's another story altogether. Um, he died and uh, he was buried with honors. During the war, there was a series of newspapers that came out. This is the first time in American history that we have a declared war and we have much editorial comment. We have newspapers dedicated to the event. And since this was the first declared war since basically the American Revolution, here is a very famous uh, newspaper of the time. It was called, whoops, sorry, <laughs> The War, aptly named. You'll see here. This was all published. This was all published during uh, the war and also the place that it was published at is where the World Trade Center is today. It was right on Vesey Street uh, in Lower Manhattan. And there's a whole bunch of these. I have several editions of this, of the war. And here's one that's very, very dear to the heart of the War of 1812. And let me see if I can show this to you, if it'll come in clearly. You will see the story here is all about impressed seamen. And this gives names of all the various individuals who had been impressed, which is really quite fascinating. Another book that's really interesting about the war is this one. And it's a medical book. And what's interesting about it is this. This is the opening cover. Share this with you. This is James Ewell, Dr. James Ewell. And he was a physician in Washington. Of course, he dedicated this book to Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas, I mean, as, as uh, James Ewell wrote this whole monstrous medical book, which is in itself fascinating to read the medical practices of the time. The back of the book has a whole monstrous chapter on the capture of Washington. Washington, D.C. And it's all about the British occupation of Washington, D.C. and the destruction of the Capitol, the White House, and, and the like. And the British made their headquarters in Dr. Ewell's home. <laughs> so, um, he actually were, was treating some of the British as well. As, and... Uh, I guess he did that to be very careful, so he didn't lose his home. And uh, they treated him quite nicely. There was a whole series of books put out by the Analectic, which was dedicated. And let me see if I can open this up and share with you. was dedicated, it's called the, let me do this carefully, it's very fragile, 
It's called the the Naval the Naval Chronicle. And it was all put together at the end of the war. And lots of stories all about um, the various captains, the various sea battles uh, of the War of 1812, and also the first biography of John Paul Jones from the American Revolution is in this series, which is fascinating. Now, let us continue here. This is perhaps one of the most fabulous things I own dealing with the War of 1812. This book here, called The War of 1812. And it's by a Mr. Russell. Now, who is Russell? It was Jonathan Russell. He was a member of the diplomatic um, representation of the United States for peace. He was part of the peace uh, peace grouping of John Quincy Adams, uh, Henry Clay, and stuff like that, setting up the Treaty of Peace in Ghent. And he published this privately. I'll show you. Here's the, the front of this, as you will see. Now, this book, is, I have all notes inside of all these books, just so anything ever happens, someone knows all the history of this stuff. Um, what's in this book is nothing short of incredible, because being that he was a diplomat, he has all of the government papers, all of the various documents, um treaties, um, messages from various commanders, various surrenders, uh, various defeats. You know, here's the loss of the Chesapeake here. And one of the fascinating things here, if I can find it very simply, is... Uh, This is Captain Hull's letter dealing with uh, the battles. And it's from the frigate, the Constitution. And the Constitution was in the number of battles. This is a direct note to the Secretary of the Navy from the captain of the Constitution uh, describing the battles that were fought on that day. There's so much stuff in here. It's it's amazing. And it goes all the way up to letters from Andrew Jackson uh, concerning the, uh, the battles um, in New Orleans. And this is something here, to, the Treaty of Peace, uh, James Madison, blah, blah, blah. And all of that diplomatic information is here as well. Um, other things is the declaration of war is in here from, from James Madison. It's just a treasure trove. A treasure trove of information on the war. Perhaps the finest thing I've ever read <laughs> on the war because, I mean... The story of the war is amazing, but it's to read the documents of the war is really incredible. Now, I know I've been talking a lot here and sharing a lot of stuff and going on, but this is, uh, this is the Annals of Congress, and this is all the things that were going on at the time of the war. 1813-1814, and it's fascinating reading the arguments that are going on in Congress, and of course, Congress having to move because the Capitol is uh, burned down. And of course, this is a monstrous book, 
And this is dealing with uh, commerce and navigation. And it's dealing with a lot of issues uh, toward 1814, 1815. Um, dealing with the British, with trade. And got to remember, trade kind of vanished in many respects, but it didn't totally stop, interestingly enough. So just to share books here and, and talk about the Analectic, uh, the National the, the Review of uh, History, Politics, the War. The War of 1812 is, in many respects today, a very underrepresented war. But at the time... It's incredible the amount of information that was flying around, the amount of accusation that was flying around, the political activity, the near destruction of the nation because of possible secession. Uh, it's, it's an amazing period of time. And when the war ended, we signed the peace treaty and basically we went to back, we went back to where we had been. Nothing gained, nothing lost. But it was a very dangerous period of time and could have been even more dangerous if Napoleon Bonaparte was not doing what he was doing. So, just some books. Uh, I hope you find that interesting. Um, I hope I explain some of this. I know I've left a tremendous amount out, but I can only talk about so much. And uh, what can I say? I'm glad it was solved. I'm glad peace was declared. And I'm glad that England and the United States never went to war again, although we came close when we went to the time of the Civil War. Thank you very much. Have a good day.